what do Albert Einstein, Madeleine Albright, Sigmund Freud, Bob Marley, Freddie Mercury, and Sergey Brin have in common? They're all refugees. A refugee, just by definition, is someone who has been forcibly displaced from their country in order to escape war or persecution. An asylum seeker is someone who claims to be a refugee, but the, the claim has to be evaluated usually by an immigration judge. And once someone is a refugee, they have additional privileges. What people don't realize is that no single refugee, no single human being is ever asked to be a refugee or actually thought that they really would be a refugee. It just happened out of their control. They may have been a doctor, a teacher, a developer, a painter in their country of origin. There are 85 million people who have been forcibly displaced. That's more than the entire population of Germany, France, the UK, Italy. And among them, 30 million of them are refugees. The unemployment rate is 50%. I actually was raised by a, a refugee family, my nanny growing up. But one of the job seekers is actually with us. She's on the Jobs for Humanity team, and she's actually going to be paired with one of us. Oh. Hi everyone, my name is Ksenia and I came from Kyiv, Ukraine. I live now in the Netherlands, uh, in the city next to Amsterdam. Um, so in Kyiv, uh, in my hometown, I was an event manager and I was making uh, all kinds of events, like conferences and uh, corporate events and business events, the full, full range. And I really liked this job and I was good at this job. But then uh, when the war started, I was forced to go, to leave, uh, to leave my country. I moved to Netherlands where my sister used to live. And here I started to look for a job, which, uh, well, at the beginning, I thought it was uh, easy to find the job. Or, um, but yes, it all depends on what kind of job, because uh, I can see the people here, the employers, they consider Ukrainian refugees to be only underqualified employers, which can be only like dishwashers and uh, maybe sales assistant in the shops, but nothing more serious. There are so many people with the higher education, with the really nice experience, like multi years of experience in their field. It can be in some digital marketing fields, it can be IT accountant, economist, and when I found this uh, this movement, uh, Jobs for Humanity, and that they work with such people as I am, so that it's, it would be a great uh, opportunity for me maybe to get a, a job which uh, is relevant to my skill. Now, with, with that in mind, I'm going to share some of the key challenges that we and refugees face when communicating with one another. Stigma adapting to a new culture, not having a professional network, not having uh, certifications that you'd recognize in some cases, a gap in employment and compliance restrictions. We may oftentimes think that, that a refugee is not as skilled as the other person. And that's a myth. Oftentimes it's because of English may not be their primary language, and um, it's really important to be able to not see the person as a victim, just listen to their stories and try to see what is it that we can learn from them. Adapting it to a new culture, whether someone is moving from Ukraine to the Netherlands or from uh, Palestine to Lebanon, then to the US, or someone uh, is in Afghanistan and then made it to Germany, they don't know that new culture, the customs are different, the resume looks different. The most important one is that they do not have a professional network. And this is why in the training, we've doubled down on this one, where we spend, are going to spend a lot of time opening up our networks for them, because that's the most valuable thing that we can do. Certifications, sometimes a person was a dentist in a particular country, and this may not be recognized. In here, look at skills, try to give an assessment of their skills, or even better, what are the skills that lead you to be successful in that role? There's going to be a gap in employment. Oftentimes, recruiters think that the gap is because of uh, laziness. Say I took a sabbatical. But in here, in just about 
the vast majority of cases, the gap in employment was necessary. Think about the skills that are gained in that gap. Compliance restrictions. All right, in Europe and in the US, you can hire refugees, point blank. Almost every single country in almost every case. And same thing for asylum seekers. But always have a legal attorney to be able to just verify that. But in the most part, in most cases, you are able to hire. And in some cases, there are special cases such as um, humanitarian parolees, for example, Ukrainian humanitarian parolees, where they have the authorization to be able to work. It's important to know if they can work or not. It's a fair question to ask. Let's move on to another community. And here, I'll actually uh, open up to you, Jason, if you just want to share a little bit about your story. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Estreisen. I'm originally from South Africa. I used to work as a maintenance technician for an engineering company where we repaired and serviced hydraulic equipment for the recycling industry. Always very hands-on. I was starting to become a pilot. And then unfortunately, I was involved in a car accident that left me totally blind. I moved to the United States to become uh, to be part of a medical trial in 2018. And once I arrived here, I was in a totally different world. Like Roy just mentioned, no network, didn't know anyone, didn't know how to approach job. I wasn't able to work because um, my visa didn't allow me to. So that big gap in the resume happened. And when I eventually was able to start looking for work, I was just lost and I was lucky enough to find, well, to be introduced to Roy, who introduced me to Job for Humanity, which gave me a purpose again to help other blind people find employment. I'm lucky enough to have a part-time job now at a wonderful organization called Wayfinder Family. I'm really happy to be here today and to be a part of this. Impaired. There are 285 million people in the world who are visually impaired. Blindness is sightlessness or complete loss of vision. Even in some cases, some people can see some light or may experience total darkness, but the vision is not usable. Low vision is a spectrum. It can go from anything less than 20-20 vision is considered visually, visually impaired. But when you generally speak about low vision, we mean pe people where the sight is extremely limited but there is some usable vision. So how do you overcome that sense? I'm gonna talk about two, two cases and then maybe a third scenario, which Jason is trailblazing. For blindness, we use screen readers that convert digital text to synthesized speech. Could be JAWS, NVDA, your, your Mac, Windows has them. There are also, um, for refreshable braille display, displays that we use, but they're less common. Usually it's screen readers. But for low vision, it's screen magnification, where you can, when you hit, you know, command plus, 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 and then the screen expands. Zoom text, Fusion, Supernova are some good tools. Some of them pair both text-to-speech and magnification. What are the top challenges they face? One, navigating the physical environment. So the solution is two offer assistance with navigation, follow their lead, offer assistance with navigation, and then obviously having an accessibility coach to be able to make sure that the space is accessible for the blind and low vision. Another challenge is making digital interfaces accessible, making print material as well digitized, and making sure that this can be read by screen readers. And a third is finding a job can be a challenge. Blind people can do just about every job, like the vast majority of jobs. And uh, that's where they trip. A lot of times it's on the employer's fault for not realizing how much a blind person can do. What challenges do hiring managers face is limited knowledge of what a blind person can do, knowing how to provide the right job accommodation. And here there's an amazing tool called uh, the Job Accommodation Network. Askjan.org can help with uh, accommodations as well. And then knowing how to create accessible documents. And then there are, you know, Microsoft's built-in accessibility checker could check what's accessible, uh, what's not. But just one accessibility expert will help cover all this. It's, the, the, it's a lot easier and cheaper than people realize. Third is returning citizens. Actually, Jerome and I both volunteered in prisons for years 
in the US, there are 77 million people in the United States alone that have a criminal record, one in every three adults. And 600, more than half a million people, 650,000 people are released from US prisons each year. Getting a job is extremely hard. A returning citizen is someone who's been justice impacted, but is someone who's done their time, completed their time, and wants to be part of the community again. This person is a person you know, Jerome and I both know, uh, <clears throat> Freddy, Freddy Sandoval, uh, saying, I have used my incarceration to change my life and work every day to make the community I live in while incarcerated a better place. I am now using the skills I gained while incarcerated to have a positive impact on society that excluded me from being a member. When we talk a little bit about the, the, the challenges they face, even I didn't print them here because they're very similar to refugees. And this is why the, when we say training for people from all walks of life is because there's a lot of commonalities. Even Jason alluded to it earlier when mentioning some of the challenges that refugees face. So I'm going to take us back to here. Someone is a returning citizen. There's stigma. Yes. Whether we, we believe it or not, we always worry about the worst. Actually, the program that Jerome and I both volunteered in was fully funded by a returning citizen who put in $250,000 to get the program running again and get people to learn more and then help people when they come out of prison, um, find jobs. And this person is um, Dave Dow. And if you've had Dave's killer bread, then that's who founded it. It's Dave Dow. Adapting to a new culture, yes, even within the United States or wherever, within wherever you are, usually returning citizens grew up in poverty, grew up in, in violent uh, areas and upbringing, um, that's, you know, in most cases, and therefore it is a new culture to be in where we are, where we grew up. Not having a professional network that goes without saying, gap in employment, compliance restrictions. Then who's considered neurodivergent? About a third of the world's population is neurodivergent. Neurodiversity is literally neuro, nerves, diversity, diversity. Neurodiversity is brain diversity. People can have ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention very quickly what each one means. But when we talk about neurodiversity, it means diversity of the brain. You've got the neurotypical, where the majority is. You've got the neurodivergent, where the minority are. Today, two-thirds of the world is in the majority, and therefore, the way they behave is packed and considered normal. And the world is adapted to them. And it's very arbitrary. Why the majority versus the minority? Well, we do this everywhere in every aspect of our lives. Think about right-handed versus left-handed people. The world is built for right-handed people, whether we're talking about guitars, coffee mugs, everything, tools, if you're a doctor, utensils, everything is, is, is built with scissors for right-handed people. So now we're going to talk about the minority, and it's a growing minority. For autistic individuals, 80% of the population is underemployed or unemployed. But what are the different types of neurodiversity? 20% have dyslexia. That's the biggest one. So that's when you have an ability, this uh, difficulty reading and writing. The, page, the words on a page look different. The letters can jumble up. You could be reading a page from a different end. Famous person with dyslexia, Sir Richard Branson. Some people have ADD and ADHD, like such as myself. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That means that you can have inattentiveness, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. You can jump from one thing to another. So for example, when I've got tasks, I do one, do 20, 30% of it, jump to an X, the third, the fourth, but then I go back to the first and the second, the third and the fourth. And meditating is extremely helpful in calming the mind. And a very famous person in here is Michael Phelps. Despite being extraordinarily focused and being, you know, the most decorated athlete of all time, uh, you know, as per number of medals gained in Olympic games, Simone Biles is also also has ADD and HDHD. Then you've got dyspraxia. These are more about physical coordination movements. You'll see people with tics with dyspraxia. Autism is 2%, even though we mostly talk about autism, but that's just 2% of neurodivergence. 
it's it's an up it's a it's a neurological difference that affects the way we sense the world we could be very light averse we could be averse to touch or smell and it's a developmental disability that starts very early in in, in life and then you've got others like Tourette syndrome dyscalculia like for mathematics and here's a bit more on each one the challenges they face some of the main ones is misunderstanding people because we have different social skills because the brain works differently sometimes things like small talk and appeasing don't naturally come in and interpersonal skills aren't as strong uh, or actually don't conform to the majority sometimes neurodivergent people can come off as blunt direct confrontational or rude but in reality they just mean well and they're just being direct and honest it's very hard to find a neurodivergent person who's who lies, who's dishonest. Another could be being genuinely a perfectionist and extremely detail-oriented and answer literally. When you ask a question, they listen to what you said really well and then answer the question with a lot of detail. And sometimes that could be too much for certain people. How to best address these challenges? Understand what we just went through. There are very different ways in which the brain acts and reacts. And then being able to be very clear with your language. And we're going to go through this with the training when we talk about what are some good interview questions versus bad interview questions. How do you prep a candidate for an interview? And then also understanding that when there is a misunderstanding, and there are very likely misunderstandings, and sometimes people get frustrated within an organization, because when we say a third of the world's population is neurodivergent, we mean that if there are 500 people at Smart Recruiters, probably 150 are neurodivergent. And sometimes we can get into arguments because we're like, oh, this, like that's, that's not what I meant. Oh, what did you mean? Well, in that case, this gives us an extra understanding. This gives us an extra reason to say, oh, oh, oh. maybe our brains are slightly built differently and we can communicate well by actually putting some clarity. Now we're ready to take, to create an inclusive hiring process for all of these communities. Prepare candidates in advance, and I'll tell you why. Share the format of the interview, who, how many people are going to be present, how long the interview will last, if it will include a tour of the facility or not. This is particularly important for people who don't easily get interviews, it calms their nerves. If someone is a, is a, is a refugee or a returning citizen, it's their shot. They're going to prepare for it, and this really relaxes them. If someone is, is neurodivergent and then... Uh, their, their, their nerves get heightened in an interpersonal conversation. At least here they can get reset. If someone is, um, is blind or has low vision, then at least if you've got some things that you want to share, share it with them in advance. This way they can use their own tools to read what needs to be done in preparation for the interview rather than putting them on the spot. Ask the candidate if they need any assistance navigating the physical space to get into the building of the room. If they have a service animal with them and the service animal looks super cute and you want to pet it, resist the urge because this animal is working at the moment and you don't want to distract it. Allow break in between multiple interviews. This is, this by the way, how to create an inclusive interview process is good for every human, not just people from diverse backgrounds and underrepresented backgrounds, because this you'll re this is super helpful and this is common stuff, but sometimes we can take this for granted and, and assume in the, in, this, in, the, in the interest of time that this may not be needed. But this is extremely helpful for just about everyone. You do this once, you build this well, everybody will be much better. And so will you with the quality of talent that's going to be coming through and the your class door reviews as well. Allowing breaks between interviews calms people's nerves, allows them to reset, allows them to process things and get ready. Before this talk, I, you know, I was connecting with Elodie and I told her, hey, I have to hop off because I need to meditate just before I start the call. And that's you know a little bit of prep time in between meetings. Then have an interview scorecard. List the top three to five skills. This is important to, include, to increase the quality of hire, but it's also extremely helpful for you not to go astray especially when working with underrepresented candidates um, and especially when you're divergent job seekers because oftentimes if interpersonal skills is not their top skill and it's not the top one in the job we can get carried away 
in being wooed by how well someone presents. So pick the top three to five skills that you need for the success of that job and have a good questions for, on how to assess each and a fair evaluation framework. Ignore so, social norms, unless making eye contact and shaking hands and uh, having this warm, deep voice is absolutely necessary for the job. It's not important. Relax that need. Firm handshakes are far less important than, than you know, our ancestors led us to believe. It's not going to make a difference in how well someone performs in their job unless it is a, one of the top three to five skills that, you've, that you need. It's a good idea to replace video interviews with skills assessments. Because if someone is not great at presenting themselves or is shy or is an um, introvert or doesn't make eye contact, but actually has the skills, then you're much better off testing for these skills. It could come as a technical interview, you know, for coding assessments, but it could also be projects, case studies, assignments, something where you can have a fair evaluation of the skills rather than of a person's presentation skills. And this helps you distinguish a good interviewer from a good hire. Then ask precise questions. What is your greatest strength or weakness? What is bad about this question? Sometimes we can think innocently that this is an okay question. There's one word here that absolutely can trip somebody. Greatest. If you are a literal thinker, you're wondering what is my greatest strength? Did I answer this correctly? And then after, even after you answer this question, you might be thinking like, is this my greatest? There's another one that's my great, greatest strength. Better question is what relevant skills can you bring to that role? Or even best is how have you demonstrated these skills that you share as a follow-up? Bad question is where will you be in five years? It's so vague. No one can answer this question, let alone people who are very precise in their answers. What about how would you like to see the next five years of your professional development evolve? Or even best, is there a specific skill you'd like to evolve in the next five years of your career? This way, you know you can focus on that skill. Then ask instead of assuming. If you have questions in the back of your mind, definitely ask. Next is what not to ask, just so that you can have that caveat. Avoid trauma-inducing questions. It's best not to ask a refugee why they left their country of origin. It's best not to ask someone who is a returning citizen what caused them to go to prison, because this is irrelevant for the interview. And it's their shot. It's a little bit of time that they have. It's a bit of a selfish question. Turn it into a positive. You could ask questions like, could you please at a high level go over the circumstances that led to this gap? And, and more importantly, what skills did you, did you gain from it? You can turn that into a positive. Don't overly focus on how a resume looks because it's, the content is more important. Uh, if someone comes from a different country, but sometimes they put their pictures, sometimes CVs are multiple pages versus one page, then it's unconscious discrimination to say, oh, no, 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 this one is not in one page. Well, well they didn't know that. And they found a bunch of jobs before with that regular CV style. And this is what's requested in their prior company. So this is where you can give them a lot of feedback, but don't get hung up on this one. Look at their skills. Look at the content. Even um, screen readers often miss spelling mistakes. If the resume reads decryption or surprise, they actually mean description or surprise. Then how to onboard and create a safe working environment. There is something to be said about treating everyone the same so they don't stand out, but at the same time, being aware to bridge any kind of differences with the rest of the team so that they can feel included. Here is a, a testimonial from a refugee. When I first joined my company in the new country, I was uncomfortable because colleagues were treating me differently, not necessarily by what was said, but even how things were said. I wanted more than anything to be treated like everybody else. Since then, I've changed jobs, and in my current role, I'm treated exactly like everyone else. I don't have any additional benefits, nor do I need to be reminded every single day that I'm different. Then there are some reasonable accommodations that you want to be aware of, and this is good for everybody. Pair them with a buddy. Super helpful if someone comes from an underrepresented community 
if they are if you like they stand out if they come from a different ethnic background than the rest of the team being paired with a buddy will give them especially when we are in a remote world being paired with a buddy will give you a lot of information exchange that would have been missed check with them on a monthly basis because then you'll be able to sense any kind of early signs of things that are missing and improve your onboarding process offer language training when needed pair with an organization that offers english if english is your first language this way they will have that extracurricular improvement of their english plus their job and that's going to smooth their inclusive inclusion in the organization ask if they need any accommodations some may need things like i need a bit of a flexible work schedule some may tell you hey i need noise canceling headsets some may tell you that hey the lights are too bright and it's kind of blinding me some may tell you that i'm actually sitting right by the water cooler and everybody every time people come in by this water cooler or by this cafe they start chatting i get distracted or they come and tap me on the shoulder just ask about those sometimes it's something things for physical uh, spacing secure accessibility software and these are not expensive at all in most cases they're 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 free always use a power la language versus language that can evoke pity and consider disability etiquette training especially for visual and hearing impairment and a great resource is askjan.org which is linked here if you don't hire how can you help yes and we're going to do a lot of that give a lot of feedback on their cv how it looked how they can improve it, the answers to the interview questions, their body languages, consider mentoring them, take this opportunity to help them get better prepared for the next interview, and then open your network, connect them to job opportunities within your company, uh, abroad within your network, post on LinkedIn on their behalf, they're looking for a job, it'll create what you're about to experience. We did what we're about to do with, with 21 recruiters at booking.com. That's just about the same number of people we have in the room here today. First hour was the training, which is what we just went through. Check. Next, and this was through a volunteer day. So just like smart recruiters have, like, you know, a sponsor day where you get a volunteer day to give back. So we took that day, chopped it into eight hours, and created this program that can change people's lives and turn us into inclusive employers. So six hours with coaching job seekers, that's the bulk of it. Three hours with one, three hours with another, the three hours broken down into four 45 minute calls. The first one is get to know one another. Take 30, 35 minutes to get to know the person, share about yourself, learn about them, build a good picture of who they are and how you could potentially help them. And then let's use the last 10 minutes to look at their resume and you'll see some of the things that you may have expected and that we talked about in the training. And this is how you really people are going to retain the training. It's actually to come face to face with their own biases. You'll be able to see a lot of the biases that you may have had when you first talk to the person and then start to get to know them a bit more about some of the stigma that you may, that you may face. All of that will be revealed in the first week as you schedule a call with the, both job seekers. You'll meet one person and then another. You can look again at the training and then you'll retain it. That first part of the training. Last 10 minutes, give them feedback on the resume. Next call, they would have improved the change of the resume, review it, and then use the bulk of the, you know, the 45 minutes, use 30, 40 minutes of those in order to look into your network, make warm introductions. Since that's the most important thing, use the third call to make more intros. And then the fourth call, help them with mock interviews and um or in generally speaking, they may have already gotten interviews thanks to you or thanks to their own efforts or thanks to the, the combination of their own efforts and then the morale boost that you gave them on how they present themselves better and what it is that you look for when you look at a resume and then open up their networks and all of a sudden they are on, you know, on speed rails. The last hour is going to be a 30-minute touch base in two weeks to see how, thing, how the call scheduling is going and then hear back from we'll all get together and then that's going to be a heartwarming 30 minutes where we kind of get to see, you know, the progress that we're making. And then finally, uh, just a touch base and celebration and success stories that we'll collect from you, from them. And you'll get to see here some things that job seekers have said. You know, one of them said, I understood how recruiters see CVs and candidates, how they build interviews, how they evaluate, how to present myself to be more noticed, how to prepare to be really ready for successful interviews. And I'm grateful for booking and its initiative to help Ukrainian job seekers. 
And then volunteers, recruiters, saying it has been a very rewarding experience to coach job seekers and help them gain confidence in their abilities, which would hopefully land them jobs, um, land their dream job in their nearest future. Truth is, 21 volunteers were paired with 42 Ukrainian refugees. In our case, it's going to be from all walks of life. 22 plus within four weeks got interviews. It's more now. And more than 10 people got hired. So this is it for now. Next steps is we've paired every person with two job seekers. A look for blocks of time where you can meet. Ideally, book the first two calls, one in the first seven days, one in the following seven days. After that, we'll have the touch base. We'll get back together. Ideally, the first two calls would be done, and then we'll do calls three and four, which are going to be network, network, network. Then I'm hoping we can create magic together.